So good evening, welcome. We can turn cameras on and the sound off. How are you all doing today? You can hear me okay, quick sound check, yes? All right. Today, I'm going to change topics completely and I'm going to be talking about a, a new, uh, very important topic that will take us a while. It is trading strategies. I'm going to be <clears throat> sharing my screen so you can see what I'm doing here. And um, <coughs> We're going to be talking about trading strategies. Uh, trading strategies is a way to for us to describe the different methods that exist when you do quantitative investing. Uh, there is, uh, as you will see, different strategies that you follow to do that. They have to do with the particular type of investments that, that you're doing, whether they are equities, whether they are bonds, whether they are a combination of the two, the return characteristics of these are very different and the risk characteristics of them are also very different. I'm going to start by making some general remarks about the strategies. They all have a a way of working, which is that they turn risk into return. We already saw this in our example of a snow fund. Uh, we were using a market inefficiency. That was a way of making some money uh, by taking uh, some risk. And they oftentimes come with what's called an information advantage. Information advantage is that you know something that many people don't know. Many others don't. Okay. Um, this is not to be confused with knowing something that you're not supposed to use for trading. There's a restriction here. Uh, Insider trading is illegal. Illegal. Okay, but that's different. That is using information <clears throat> that you're not supposed to use. So some information, some information from insiders. should not be used. For example, if you are the CEO of a company the company uh, the CEO of a, a, a company cannot trade without um, permission, notification, a process. The stock of the company. Okay. Um, in, in, in North America and in many markets, if you have inside information about a company, you cannot uh, trade uh, the company. This has been like this since 1933. It's been there for a long time. Before 1933, you could do it. It was legal to do that, and and this led to the crash of 1929, because insider trading can lead to market manipulation. This is not what I'm talking about. This is not what I'm talking about. Uh, oftentimes, what happens is that um, 
oftentimes what happens is that um, the uh, the people who run companies they can trade the stock of the company but they have to go through a process they have to ask for permission they have to make some filings okay that's 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 not what I refer when I say that uh, there is an information advantage. An information advantage means that you know something which others don't and you are allowed to use it. Mm -hmm. For example, for example, let's say that you are um, a specialist, an example. An example here. Let's say that you trade um, medical companies, medical drug companies. Then what you can do is you can uh, create a, here's an example, you can create a, a group, an advisory group of doctors that tell you information that other people don't have. Okay, This is a group of doctors, they only work for you very likely, so they give you information that other people don't have. And while other people will be trading those stocks based on rumors, you trade them based on facts. And this gives you an information advantage. It's one example. And when we go to our snow fund, we also had an information advantage. The information advantage is we knew uh, the type of economics the cities and the ski resorts were looking for. That's another example of an information advantage. And we're going to see things like this when we see the um, different trading strategies. There's going to be a situation where we see market inefficiencies and any situation where we see an information advantage. Okay, we will always be able to identify those two. Um, other characteristics is that their return profile is not typically not going to be directly linked to market direction. Good trading strategies do not depend on market direction. Some will, but most will not, and we will see. Another example is that they can trade either exchange-traded or OTC securities. These are over-the-counter securities. Um, do you know what this is? Do you know? Can you answer in the chat yes or no? Whether you know what an OTC over-the-counter, over-the-counter, the counter can you see no 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 okay so you don't know all right so let me tell let me explain this to you okay exchange traded securities exchange traded are stocks futures they trade on exchange on exchanges Okay. <clears throat> Bonds do not trade on exchanges, okay, but they trade through brokers. So, ex so bonds will be over the counter. Options. Um, the common ones, the common options, they are exchange traded. Others are not. So um, an example, there's no, there's no swap is over the counter. Over the counter means that you don't go to an exchange to buy them, you have to go to a bank and you have to a bank or a broker and you have to tell them I'm looking for exactly this product and they make it for you. They sell it to you over the counter. Over the counter is as when you buy bread or something like that. 
it's given to you over the counter. It's not in an exchange. Okay. <clears throat> so we will see examples of that. <clears throat> um, they may have a limited opportunity set. Okay. Sometimes we will see that when we create some of these trading strategies, we can only trade a limited amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, they may have, they may be illiquid. Okay, they only trade every once in a while. An example is our snow fund. Our snow fund is illiquid. Once you buy it, you cannot sell it. Probably no one will want to buy it from you. You have to hold it until it matures. You cannot sell it to anybody. You have to, you're stuck with it. And in general, they are innovative. They are doing things that people don't know or things which are, are very new. Let me ask a question and also please answer in the chat. Do you know what financial options are? Options. Let's uh, check the chat. Let's see. Tell me if you know what options are. <coughs> Financial options. Like call options. Uh, call options. Put options, etc. Can you answer? Can you answer? Okay, I, I don't get answers, so that leads me to believe that you don't know what they are. Okay, I will explain that too. Okay, <coughs> so I suspect you don't know what they are. Okay, <clears throat> very good. So, I'm going to, um, <clears throat> when we look at the different trading strategies, <clears throat> I'm going to <clears throat> look at their risk and their return characteristics. The risk will be given, as we saw last week, by the standard deviation, and the return is just the expectation. And we will see that there are some strategies, for example, I have it, this one here. This one has very high risk and has high return. We see, for example, uh, this one here <clears throat> has low risk and low return, <clears throat> right? Um, this one here, for example, it looks very good. It has very high return and low risk. It's the highest return, right? And low risk. And so on and so forth. Okay? So on and so forth. So this is a convenient way to view these strategies from a risk and return perspective. <clears throat> but before we get into them, I want to show you a resource, something that would probably be useful to you. For that, I'm going to share my uh, another uh, part of my screen, <clears throat> and I'll tell you something that I encourage you to to um, to check. Is this? <clears throat> This is a company in Chicago, in the United States. It's called Heads Fund Research. Heads Fund Research. And what this company does is they, they sell investments into different types of trading strategies. And those strategies, they call them indices. Okay, uh, HFRX indices. Uh, these indices, <coughs> Um, have some generic names. You can check them here. Global Hedge Fund Index, a Relative Value Arbitrage Index, so on and so forth. But the ones which are interesting to us today are these ones here. Uh, equity, Equity Hedge. These are 
strategies that trade in stocks. Okay, we're gonna see them today. We're gonna understand what these strategies do. Another one that we have here is <clears throat> event driven. We will see them today. Uh, sometimes they trade on stocks, sometimes they trade on bonds, um, other, others, and they would have all these C's also. We will, we will see them today, maybe today or maybe next week, but we're going to see those. These are the strategies that we're going to see in this course. Uh, I have others, I have the macro, which we will also see, relative value, we will also see, and many others. <clears throat> One advantage of this um, website, which is here, one advantage is that these indices have um, <clears throat> data that you can download. So they are, I like them because they give us downloadable data that we can use for calculations. Okay, so we're gonna be using this data. One of the things that I would like you to do this week is <clears throat> to, uh, you have to sign up. You have to sign up. Um, you have to sign up and <clears throat> when you sign up, you have access to the historical data. So I, in the database section, uh, you can get, I'll show you what we're looking for. <clears throat> in the, if I go there, I'm going to navigate to the HFRX indices, okay? And these indices have data that we can download. Hmm? But you have to be a member of this website. So I would like you to um, <clears throat> become to sign up so you can download the HFRX index performance series. This is something you download and you download into Excel. Okay, so you have to you have to sign up. This is me. So you need to sign up and try to download the data. I want you to try that before I give you the next assignment uh, because I want you to, I want to check if you can do it. I, I assume you can, you have to go through a process, you have to answer some questions. So assignment number four, so five, assignment number five is let's start with signing up. And then when you sign up, download data and then I will ask you to do things with the data okay is that clear okay, so let's do that and let's see that you can actually sign up are there any questions on this So, um, I'm going to then go back to my slide, my presentations uh, itself. And for the different data that you download, you can do something like this. We will talk about that later. First, you download the data, and then we will do something like this. <clears throat> you will do something like this. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, there's different types of uh, strategies. Uh, they are listed here. Um, convertible arbitrage. We will see that today. Distress securities, event driven, fixed income. Um, and uh, think you can view them here. This is in terms of how popular they are, how many, how much money is in each of those uh, strategies. 
you can see that many of them are equity based equity 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 is stocks equity refers to stocks fixed income refers to bonds swaps etc okay um, we will see all of these in detail and what i mean by looking at this is that stocks is the majority is the dominant uh, style you see equity 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 okay all of these are stocks so because of that we're going to start with stocks today i want to start talking about stocks i will talk about trading bonds and trading other things in other lectures we're going to start focusing on stocks um, hmm? more than 25 percent of all the trades of all the assets are on stock related strategies and there's many ways of, of trading stocks many ways of trading stocks uh, you have something with style which called long, long only that means we only buy stocks hmm? um, most of the styles they go short and i want to explain to you what shorting means okay short stocks we need to understand what shorting means hmm? shorting is the opposite of long long is when you buy short is when you sell typically you sell something you already have but when you trade you can sell something you do not have it's like buying a negative amount of stocks we will see how that works okay and when you start combining long with short then you have lots of very interesting strategies like equity market neutral quant equity long short we're going to see all of these uh, strategies now okay it all has to do with the ability of going long and short buying and selling <clears throat> Okay, so I want to start with the easy one, which is long. Long means we buy. We buy. Okay. Uh, we will see shorting later. There's different ways of buying stocks. When you buy, why would you buy a stock? When you buy a stock, what is driving you to buy a stock? Of course, you're driven to performance. You buy stocks because you want to make money. That's the main reason you buy stocks. But how do you decide if a certain stock will make you money or not? This is what distinguishes stock traders. There is a group which is called fundamental. We're going to see them now. A fundamental stock trader will buy and sell stocks based on their fundamental characteristics. They will look at their accounting information. We're going to see this in a minute, OK? Um, there's other types, which is driven by growth. These are companies that don't look very good. Their accounting doesn't look very good. But people think that they will have a good opportunity for the future. So this, this will typically have good accounting. Their accounting numbers look good. Here, the accounting numbers are not good. Accounting, but they have good prospect. They have good perspectives. So you think they're going to be doing very well. OK? This one is something intermediate. This is something intermediate, okay, between growth and fundamental. We will see that. Momentum is you look for, for stocks that are moving very fast in value, okay? Look for stocks that are moving significantly in one direction on high volume. So you buy them, and then you have to be very careful to exit the stock to sell it before it starts to turn. Okay, so uh, when you have a stock that behaves like this, so I'll give you a graph. Uh, you have a stock that 
if you look at the price and the price behaves like this that's a momentum stock then you buy it because it's going up okay that's but then these stocks they tend to do this and then you have to sell them before they turn around so that's a momentum that's a momentum trade okay they are typically short term They are typically short term. And then there is another one which is called technical. Technical analysis is uh, you develop signals by looking at charts. Uh, and they are very algorithmic. They follow recipes. This we are not going to see in this course. Okay? And we are not going to see in this course. I some people use them and some people believe in them but there's really nothing to explain people just follow very simple algorithms and they, they I, I don't consider them to be interesting to explain in a course um, i have an example here of a company called netflix which is very popular in in north america this is what people use to watch movies here in North America. Um, the company started about 10 years ago and um, see it, it rose very quickly. It rose very quickly in value. When, you, when a company rises very quickly in value, it's called a momentum trade. Mm -hmm. If the company loses momentum very quickly, it's also a momentum trade, but it's a momentum trade on the short side, and we will see what that means later. Okay, so momentum traders try to profit from the uptrend. Uptrend is this a company moves up very quickly. Hmm? And in this particular case, even the CEO of Netflix admitted that Netflix was moving too fast. Okay? And so that's a momentum trade when a stock moves very fast. You probably see this with Chinese stocks very often. They tend to move very fast. You tend to have a lot of momentum trades. The problem with momentum trades is that there's something called momentum reversal. That's when the turn, when the momentum, when the trade turns. That's very risky. Okay, that's very risky. You t you tend to avoid that. This is something which is reserved for people who do this all day long, and they have to be very alert to these momentum reversals. Mm -hmm. um, some people think that the momentum is reversed because they come, they you lose convexity. This looks like it's going up, so it looks like it'll have to have a zero derivative and then come down. That's not how it works, okay? Uh, you can have a very sharp momentum reversals like that. Very sharp. So that's a momentum reversal. And these are risky. These are risky. <coughs> these have less risk. Why? Because you buy companies whose fundamentals, whose accounting is very good. These are companies that have lots of cash, lots of revenue, so because of that they do not move so quickly, so the risk is less, they have less risk because of this, okay, the fundamentals protect them, okay, and, and the fundamentals refers to the, buy, to the basic accounting information of the company. I have an example here. Um, so this is how you would do this fundamental. These are the fundamentals. What I have here is some companies. And these companies have, uh, well, this is Apple, Microsoft, Verizon, HP, Hewlett Packard, HP, Google, which is, you know, it's actually the, the name of the company is now Alphabet. And these are some of the metrics that you use to determine if a company is good or bad. Okay. Earnings 
per share. Can I ask you if you already know what these terms mean? These are accounting terms. These are accounting terms. These are accounting terms. Um, can I ask you, can you answer in the chat if you know earnings per share? I don't know if you know. So can you answer that in the chat, please? Yes, yes. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Um, PE ratio, price to equity ratio, you know that? Please answer in the chat. Yes, okay, good, good, good. So I assume you know you know all of these. This is very good. I was, I was hoping you did. So then fundamental equity trading is the following. You look at a company. Um, so from if, let, let, let me ask a question. And again, in the chat, okay? Um, if you look at all these companies and if you focus on the P-E ratio, which one is your favorite? Which one would you buy from a P-E ratio perspective? Which one is the one that you buy? Which one? Please answer in the chat. Which one would you buy? Exactly, that one, okay? From a PE ratio, that's the one you buy because the price is the cheapest. You buy a certain amount of equity very cheap, okay? Um, good. If instead, depends on the company, sometimes the PE ratio is what matters, sometimes the earnings per share is what matters. From an earnings per share, which one would you buy? Google, exactly. So earnings per share, you want it to be high. This, you want it to be low, okay? And you have other, um, you know, total debt to assets. Usually, what fundamental equity traders do is they look at all of these different, uh, and more, uh, look at all of these different numbers. And then you create a financial picture from all of these numbers you create a financial picture that drives decisions In doing this, this is complicated. You have to take into account the sector that the company is, you have to Okay. For example, if you're looking at um, banks, the uh, P-E ratio is not a very good description of the bank. Okay. The earnings per share, maybe it is. Um, the price to sales ratio is not. So depending on the sector, these things don't matter. If you look at technology companies, tech companies, tech, tech companies, uh, I mean, all of these are te technology companies here. Technology companies, are your <clears throat> earnings per share are, is considered to be not very, uh, not very um, uh, useful, and the reason is that technology companies, when the earnings are high, it's too late to buy it. You want to buy companies which are where the earnings are low before they become high. So technology companies are typically not very. They are typically not very good for fundamental analysis. Uh, you, most people do not buy technology companies from a fundamental analysis pr perspective. When the fundamentals are good, it's too late. It's too late, okay? So f f um, technology companies, typically they fall, they fall under a growth. This is where technology companies usually uh, do better. So how do you tell if a company 
so here you have to follow in growth trading you have to follow early warning signs that the company is going to do very well okay and there's there are some signals that tell you that okay some signals that tell you that so these again these are companies that the the fundamentals don't look good yet don't look good yet they will look better and what makes you think that they will look better later you want to buy cheap so you want to buy companies that don't look very good so there is one of them which is historical growth strength which is how is the company growing how fast is it growing Okay, um, if you look at, so this is interesting because if I look at the previous slide here, this slide tells me what these numbers are. Okay, but they don't tell me what they were. So what you need to do to understand historical growth strength here is you, you need to track fundamentals over time. And look at the percentage change. Look at the percentage change. If the percentage change is good, like 5% per year, 10% per year, 12% per year, depending on the size of the company. For small companies, the growth is higher. For bigger companies, more than 4 billion, with 5% growth, that's considered to be growth strength. So if the company is growing at a good rate, then this is considered to be positive, considered to be good. So the fundamentals are not yet good, but they are on their way to be good. You want to buy these companies cheap, okay? Historical growth strength. Now, another quantity that you look at is forward earnings growth. So you have to make an assessment how this company is going to grow. And we're going to see this going back to netflix see let's go back to this why did this company grow so fast why this was a momentum trade okay but it was a momentum trade created by a growth assessment why well the this is what people were thinking <clears throat> in 2013 the internet streaming on the internet was starting. So analysts would look at Netflix and they would start to do calculations. You say, well, if streaming is starting, this company shows movies through streaming, so they have no costs. And if they have no costs, everything they have is just revenue. So I don't care if these companies fundamentals are bad. I don't care if their revenue is very low because this company has no costs and everything is going to come into revenue. So this is what you call a growth projection. And this is what drove Netflix into a growth company that became a momentum trade. Okay, So you have to make projections. And if you have a earning a growth which is in excess of 10%, this is considered to be strong. Okay. And then <clears throat> another one is efficiency, costs, revenue. And this, for example, in the case of Netflix, that was already clear. The costs, the costs of this company were very low. Efficiency, streaming. Okay, revenue, no competition. So these are the characteristics that you take into account to determine if a company is a growth company or not. Okay. Now, I talk about Netflix, but the best example that is used for a growth trade is Microsoft in 2003. So uh, what I have here is I have here for you the analysis done on Microsoft in 2003, a long time ago. Okay, now it's not a growth trade or a momentum trade, but back then 
in 2003, it was a growth trade. So when you look at the, uh, the numbers for Microsoft in 2003, I have the five-year earnings figures. Again, you have to look at the, at the curve. For fundamental trading, you look at the number. For growth, you look at the curve. And you see that the first, the five-year average annual sales growth is 16%. That's very strong, very strong. Okay. Uh, you can see this is how revenue was growing, earnings per share growth, and this was this is the benchmark. These are benchmarks. A benchmark is what you measure against. Okay, so you, here you can see that this benchmark was very high. Okay. This the the diff, sorry the the um, here you can see that the outperformance to the benchmark was very high. Hmm? This is for earnings per share growth, very high, much higher than the benchmark. And again, you look at growth. The numbers were not good yet, but they were. Uh, another thing that you look at is a projected earnings growth. Okay, so um, this is the projected earnings growth. <clears throat> this has been the actual, since 2003, actual. You see that it's not so good. This, this part here is not good. But the projection is very good. You have to make your projections, and this is difficult, okay? This is what people do. You make projections, and from the projections, you see how well they work. Another one was costs and revenue control. And what you can see is that the costs were going down. Good. Okay? Um, this is the... Um, the um, you can see here that if you compare the industry with Microsoft historically in the past no historically in the past the past not good okay but the projection is this is coming down you see it's coming down so this was considered to be good so the past was not good, the direction is good. Okay. And um, something similar for the return on equity. So this is how you would this is how you do analysis on growth stocks. You look at the past, doesn't look very good, but then you can see that the direction is the right one. And this is what drive drives um, investors who are growth focus to invest in companies like this. Okay, any questions? Okay. Good. So this is the other uh, thing. GARP means growth at a reasonable price. This is an intermediate. So growth traits are here, value fundamental, value fundamental. Is here garbage in the middle? Okay, that's the middle. These are people who would do some sort of accounting analysis, and it, it's not as bad as growth is good, but the growth perspective is even better. Okay, so a garb trader would look at the fundamentals and growth. They would not invest in a company just because of its growth projections. See somewhere which is in the middle. Okay, it's an intermediate style. And so this is how long trades in equity are done. But now what I need to do is I need to talk about going short because shorting stocks is a very important methodology to 
take full advantage of what stock trading can do for you. Okay. So, um, there's two things to know. One thing is to know what shorting is, and the other is to know how you do it. So please answer in the chat if you know what short is. Please answer in the chat if you know what shorting stocks is. Yes or no? Yes, good. Okay, perfect. Great. So then I will show you how you do it. Um, I, I don't know if you know how you do it. I suspect not. Uh, I'll tell you how shorting stocks is done. Okay. Um, shorting stock, uh, shorting stock is all called stock lending. So what you have to do is you have to go to a broker. For shorting stock, you have to go to a broker. Because what you're going to be doing is you're going to you need someone who is willing to lend it to you. So when you do a trade, you call your broker and to short the stock, it has to be lent to you. Then it immediately is sold and you get cash, you get money, but then you owe the stock. So the, um, the process for that it starts with what's called the locate process. You need to find investors who have this stock. You need a broker for that. Okay. Um, big brokers in North America are Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. Brokers in China are Everbright Securities and, and others. These are people, these are companies that have the stocks of many investors. So. They can lend one to you to go short. Okay, so this is this is not something you can do directly through the exchange. You have to go through a broker who will lend it to you. Um, there is a very interesting restriction. It was called the uptick rule. The thing is, th this has been eliminated, but this has been there for many, many, many decades. Okay, it's been there for since. 1933 until 2008. All these years you had this rule, and there was a rule in the United States. And I want to show to you why, what this rule is and why it was there. If the stock is here and you want to short the stock, you give your order to the broker. You want to short the stock, but then the broker cannot sell the stock for you while the price is dropping, you can sell it here. And this is a tick. Do you know what a tick is? Tick. A tick is every movement, every trade creates a change in price, which is oftentimes very small. That's a tick. So the broker had to wait until the price goes up one tick before they can short sell this stock. They couldn't short sell it here. They'll have to short sell it here. And this has consequences because that means that you typically want to short the stock when it's high. But you have to wait until the price goes up one tick, something that happens only after the stock has gone down a few steps. Okay, so this is um, suboptimal you have to short here not here okay um, again this has been eliminated why was this rule in place well this rule was in place because without it in principle you could manipulate the stock price if you have a lot of money you can short sell the stock and drive its price down almost to zero Okay, and this is something that was done to prevent it. This was done by the um, by the regulators in 2008. It was considered that this was no longer needed, and it was removed. But this was there to prevent 
price manipulations. Okay, the uptick rule. And another thing that comes with a short shorting stocks is what's called the short squeeze. A short squeeze is the following. You, if you are shorting a stock, you may be required to return it. If the lender of the stock wants to sell it, if you have, then you have to give it back. Of course, if you go to a very big broker and they lend you the stock of someone to sell it, and this person wants to buy it, they can exchange the stock for another one. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they can <coughs> replace that, that stock for another one. But there are situations where there are no more stocks to be lent. No more. They run out. I'm going to show you an example. Okay. In that case, you have no choice but to buy the stock and return it to the lender. This is called a short squeeze and is the big, big risk. Big risk for shorting stocks. Okay. I'm going to show you one example of this. Uh, so this is what I explained. It's explained in words. What I explained to you, it's explained here in, in, in words, okay? And this is the very famous short squeeze on Volkswagen. Volkswagen stock. So I'm going to explain it to you, okay? Um, it happened in 2008. But this, this has a very interesting history. This short squeeze has a very interesting history. <clears throat> and it's the relationship between, you, 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 know, you know Volkswagen? You know the company? You know the car? Volkswagen? Yeah. And you know the car Porsche? You know the car Porsche? Porsche? Yes, okay, yes. So this, uh, this is a car, this is a car. Uh, do you know the relationship between Porsche and Volkswagen, historical relationship? Do you know the relationship between Porsche and Volkswagen as car companies? So the relationship, I mean, maybe I can find it here. So I, I, I'm going to show you, I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to show you the story because you have to understand this. This is something very, very important historically. Uh, so I'm going to share my a browser. Okay, so yeah, you can see that. Maybe I can make it bigger. I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. So Porsche is, is a, was a family, was a family, a family company. Okay. Um, which had been around more or less when cars were invented in 1931, 1930s, okay. Um, and uh, this is a company that was doing agricultural equipment, uh, tractors and, and, and things like that. <clears throat> now, during World War II, <clears throat> during World War II, um, Volkswagen uh, became a division of Porsche that was taken by the government, okay? It was taken by the government. And um, I think it was taken actually by, by the Hitler uh, government, okay? And um, so Porsche and Volkswagen were divided. Or divided. Hmm? Um, were divided. 
this was a long time ago. This was in the 1940s, more or less, in 1940s. Okay, a long time ago. Okay, so the thing is uh, <clears throat> that the Porsche family wanted it back. They wanted to get So Porsche, the Porsche family wanted Volkswagen back. And what they did is they waited until the year 2008. We're talking about almost 100 years, okay? They, maybe 50, 60 years. They waited a long time. They wanted it back. And <coughs> this was the situation. On Friday, October 24, Porsche had always owned a little bit of it. It was it, it owned 42%, just under half. And then this is, uh, sorry, this is the, the government in the form of the state of Lower Saxony. This is the government. Owned 20% of Volkswagen. So Porsche owned 42%. And the government owned 20 percent the rest was publicly traded and at that time 13 percent of the stocks 13 percent of the stocks were on loan for shorts on loan for shorts which meant is that people had take had borrowed the stock to short sell it so 13 percent of the stock was shorts okay this is considered to be safe. 13% of the stock was considered to be safe. This stock does not trade. Does not trade. Meaning neither Porsche nor the government would sell those stocks. And that's, that's about 60% of the stock. So only 40% of the stock trades. So 13% is, is a lot, is 13. 13% of 40% is almost half, almost half, okay? Um, but it's less than half, so it was considered to be safe. It's less than half. Now, you may not remember, because you're very young, but in 2008, cars or car companies, car companies, Car companies, car companies were not good. They were in trouble. Okay, General Motors, Chrysler, they went bankrupt. Okay, uh, Ford almost went bankrupt. That was the big crisis, and it was bad for car companies. Okay, so everybody wanted to short car companies. GM, many traders were short General Motors, many traders were short Chrysler, and many people were short Volkswagen. Okay, now this is what happened. On Sunday, two days later, on Sunday, Porsche made an announcement. Porsche made an announcement. And the announcement is that Porsche owned options on Volkswagen, cash settled options on Volkswagen. And you know what options are, you told me earlier, right? They own 30% of the stock of Volkswagen through options. What does that, what does that mean? This creates a very interesting situation because <clears throat> if you add all these numbers, the number is more than 100%. We already saw that this does not trade. This does not trade. This does not trade. And this is not going to trade. They're just buying the stocks. They're not going to sell them. What does that mean? That means that all of this is more than 100%. So this, people knew immediately when this announcement was made on Sunday, people knew what was going to happen on Monday? Or what was happening on Monday? 
is a very famous short squeeze. Everybody rushed to buy the stock. And there aren't enough stocks. So, so those people got hurt badly. Those people got hurt badly. Okay? Why? Because the price would go up and you cannot wait. You have to you have to buy the stock to return it to the owner. Because they want to sell it too. Okay? So uh, when when the market opened on October 27, uh, Volkswagen rose. And as it goes up, stock owners want to sell. So short sellers were hold on the stock loan, they had to buy the stock to return it to the owners on Monday. Okay. And the stock price rose almost 300% in just a few hours. It was very interesting that uh, for a few minutes, Volkswagen was the most expensive company in the world because of this. Very famous short squeeze. These short squeezes happen sometimes. They are rare, but they, when they happen, they're very, very uh, brutal. They're very, very big. Do you understand the short squeeze of Volkswagen? Any questions? I guess no questions. So I, th I think you understand. Okay. So the short squeeze of Volkswagen was a very big event, and it tells us the risks involved in this. Sometimes the short squeeze is not a true squeeze; it's just something that happens that you are short a stock, and then a stock, and then simply someone buys the stock. And when someone buys the whole company, okay, the 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 stock can move four times its price up. If the stock moves four times the price up, then you lose 400%. 400%. If you buy a stock long, you can lose at most 100%. You cannot lose more than 100%. But if you buy, if you short sell a stock, you can lose 400% if the stock moves very violently up. Okay? So shorts, is something which are very risky. When you do single name shorts, we're gonna see the difference between single name shorts and index shorts, it's coming, okay? But anyway, this is a good example and <clears throat> it shows some of the risks that we have when we do this. So <clears throat> how do you do short selling? We saw how you do long equity and for that you do fundamental analysis, you do growth analysis, you do carb, other things. For short selling, you have to know what's bad about companies. Okay, and one way of doing that is, for example, looking at uh, negative company information that could come from filings, lawsuits, things like that. Okay, and this is how you get information about bad things happening to to companies. <clears throat> In doing this, it's very important to monitor what's called the short interest ratio. <clears throat> which is the difference between how many stocks are short and the average daily trading volume. <clears throat> if this number is high, then risk is high. If this number is low, risk is low. Okay? <clears throat> Takeovers is a source of risk. If a company is taking over, the price can go up by four times, like we saw. Okay? Short squeeze, which are the case of, uh, of a Volkswagen. And the thing with going short is there's no end to how much money you can lose. So the stock could go up by 10 times and then you lose a thousand percent. There's no, there's unlimited liability. Okay. So it's a style that you have to do with very, you have to do very, very carefully, very, very carefully. <clears throat> I have here an example of a long short portfolio, long short. So longs are the positions where you have positive amounts of stocks, okay? Um, 
the number of shares is is, is is long, meaning it's positive. Okay, positive, 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 positive. Hmm? And short is, for example, this one here. This one is 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 a short. That means that the number of stocks is actually negative. In this case, you you have negative 100 units of Google stock. Okay, and it shows here as a negative value because this is something that you owe as negative value. When Google goes down in price, this thing goes up because the negative number is less negative. Hmm? That's how you make money on the short. You make money on the short when it goes down because your value is less negative. Hmm? And we see th in this example that I have here for you, you see three cases of shorts. Now, this is called a single name short because it's linked to a company, one company, Google. Um, <clears throat> this thing we have here is called an index short. SPY is an index, it's the S&P 500 index. So this is not one company, this is 500 companies put together. It's an index short. Why do you short an index? Do you think that all 500 companies are going to go down in price? No, that is not why you do it. That is not why you do it. The reason you do this is as follows. This is very important. I'm going to tell you. The reason you do that is when you look at all of these positions, this is a lot of money on long positions, but you don't know if the market is gonna go up or down tomorrow. You don't know. The market may go up, may go down. You know that these companies are good. Maybe you are a fundamental trader and you think these are good companies, okay? But you don't know if the market is gonna go up or down tomorrow. If the market goes up, these companies will probably go up. If the market goes down, these companies will probably go down, but because they are good, you think they will go down less than the market. So what you do is you take a short position on the market. If the market goes up, these good companies will go up more than the market. So this will make more money than what you lose here. And if the market goes down, these companies will lose money, but maybe less money than the whole market, which is here. The idea is that if the market goes up or down, you make money all the time. That's the idea. That's what you want to do. So that's why this is an index short. You're trying to remove the influence of the market in the buildup of your equity portfolio. And then finally, I have here an sector hedge because this corresponds to this this is the nasdaq index index so this is the index of tech stocks okay sometimes what happens is that all of the stock all of the technology stocks they go up or down at the same time they go up and down together and because there's some technology companies here i have here a apple i have a dell uh, Google is already a, a short, so to hedge these, um, to hedge these stocks, I use an, I use a sector hedge. This is um, still a group of stocks, it's still an index, but it's not as big as the S and P five hundred. It doesn't have five hundred stocks. It may have thirty stocks. Okay, and this is what I use. To hedge. The objective is always the same. The objective is, the objective is that you want a portfolio which does not have no market direction, no market direction. As you know, if you invested in stocks, if you have your long stock portfolio, when the market goes up, you typically make money, and when the market goes down, you typically lose money. Here, in building these long short portfolios, you want to make money all the time. You want to make money when the market is down and when the market is up. That's the idea. 
And what we're going to see with one example is that the risk profile, the risk return profile of this type of portfolios is very different from the one that you have when you do long only. Okay, we're going to see that next, and we're also going to see that in doing these types of trades, other considerations like, for example, cash management, which is going to become important now, will also have a significant effect on how, what kind of performance we're going to obtain. Okay, all right. So I'm going to explain this with one. Um, other example, which is this one. I will end this uh, the class today after I finish the explanation of this example. This is a very important example. Okay, very simple, but very important. And in this, I'm going to assume I'm going to use very small numbers, not because of any particular reason. Um, normally, you do this with millions and millions of dollars, but I'm going to use this small number. Let's say that I have one thousand dollars that's it one thousand dollars and i want to trade two stocks one could be an index it doesn't matter mm -hmm. uh, the stocks a and b i say a is a stock i like and b is a stock i don't like okay um, a is a hundred dollars b is a hundred dollars so i think I think, I think, but I don't know, I'm not sure. I think A is going to go up and B is going to go down. But this up and down is relative. This is, this up and down is relative. Relative to each other or relative to the market. I just think they're gonna A is gonna do better than B. But I have no way of knowing if A is really gonna go up by itself. The market may go down and A just goes down less than the market. Hmm? So this is relatively speaking. Because of that, I build this portfolio. I go long nine A's and I go short nine B's. Why? Because I don't know if the market is gonna go up or down. And I think that both A and B will go with the market, but A will do better than B. So my thesis is that it's not so much that A is going to go up and B is going to go down. My thesis really is that A is better than B. That's my thesis. That's what I know. And this does not imply, does not imply that A is going to go up. Or that B is going to go down. Very likely, this is going to be created by the market, not by the stocks themselves. I just think that A will be better than B. Why do I think that? Well, it depends. If I'm a fundamental trader, or I'm a growth trader, or a gap trader, why do it depends on how I do my analysis. But when I have an analysis that tells me that, uh, when I have an analysis that tells me that my you know a is better than b then i can build a trade like this okay note one thing in building this trade i'm going to say because i have one thousand dollars and a is 100 i'm going to say i'm going to do nine a's because nine a is nine hundred dollars i have a thousand so i have enough okay so are you all with me do you understand this example I'm going to show you what happens now, but I want you to understand this, this portfolio, nine A's long and nine B's short. Okay. So with this portfolio, I'm going to do the accounting. I'm going to start with this. Look here first. Okay. Look here. This is what's called trade financing. Okay. I want to assume that I was right. A goes up by 5% and B goes up by, sorry, A goes up by 10% and B goes up by only 5%. This is what's called scenario analysis. 
we're going to do a lot of scenario analysis. It helps us understand what happens if certain things happen. Okay? So, this is now. I have $1,000. And I buy 9 A's, which costs me 900 and I go short 9 B's that costs me how much? How much do I have to pay to short 9 B's? I don't have to pay anything. They give me money. When I go short 9 B's, I get $900 in cash. So it turns out that I still have $100. Sorry, $1,000. Because the 900 I spent on A, I get back when I, when I, when I short my Bs. I owe $900 in stock, but I have $900 in cash. Okay? So, let's stick with this trade. After a year, my $1,000 in cash is $1,000. My 9 A's, are $990 because they went up in price by 10% and B only went up by 5% so I owe a little bit more than $900 I owe $945 um, I'm going to assume that I have to pay 1% financing fee usually when you go short the stock you have to pay for borrowing the stock you have to pay less than 1% usually it's only a few Know, like 0.3% or something, but let's say it's 1%, okay? That's the fee. Let's say it's 1%. I'm, I'm going to assume it's 1% because it's easy to calculate 1%. That means that net-net, I will make $36 profit, which is 3.6%, okay? On this trade, a goes up by 10%, B goes up by 5%, I go up by 3.6%. Is this, this is good or not good? What do you think? Do you think this is good? Let me ask you a question. Okay, actually, actually in the chat, do you think this is a good trade or a bad trade? What do you say? Use the chat. Tell me if this is good or bad. What do you think? What do you think? You don't think? Not bad. Not bad. In fact, I would say is good. Why is it good? You may say, hey, A went up by 10, B, that is not a good stock, went up by 5%, and I only go up by 3.6%, I'm the worst. But no, that's, that is not how you have to think. Because what would happen if A goes down by 5%, Let's say A goes down by 5% and B goes down by 10%. Remember, our thesis is that A is good and B is bad. Okay? So what happens in that case? If A, and again, we don't know if market is going up or down. No one knows that. Okay? No one knows that. So if A goes up by 5%, but goes down by 5% and B goes down by 10%, then this thing here, is 900 minus 45 dollars which is nine which is 855 and then this one b is uh 900 dollars plus 90 which is 810. so i end up making this is the value of that this is the value of that okay i pay so this gives me a profit here of 45 dollars Minus nine is 36. The same, the same. So 
this is interesting because it looks like I may, as long as A does better than B, I make money. And since I don't know if the market is going to go up or down, no one knows that. Okay. I only know that A is better than B, which is easier to know than to know whether the market is up or down. Because of that, this is a good trade, because it is a trade that will make me money if the market is up or down as long as A does better than B. And that's why it's good. In other words, the risk profile of this trade has nothing to do with the risk profile of A or B. So this is something which is the risk profile. The risk profile of this trade is low. As we saw last week, it has no beta. It has no market exposure. It's low. A and B have high market exposure. Both A and B have high market beta. We saw that we can measure market exposure with the beta. We saw that last week. But this one is no beta, very low risk. And you already know that return has to be divided by the risk. If the risk is low, this 3%, although smaller than that, is good because the risk is very low. Okay? The risk is very low. Okay, we're not, we'll have to do linear regression, calculate the betas to calculate the risk adjusted return to calculate the sharp ratio of this, as we saw that. We're not there yet, okay? But this, you understand that this is a good trade. This is a good trade. But let me go beyond. I'm now going to open a very interesting discussion, which we will continue next week. Because imagine I do this. Some of you may realize that because when I short B, I get $900 in cash. So this $1,000 I don't really need. I don't need it. So what happens if I do this trade with only allocating $500? I use the other 500 for something else. What happens? See, you may say, oh, with $500, I cannot buy nine A's. You can say that, but that, that's not true because I'm shorting nine B's. That gives me $900. So of course, I can, I, can buy, I can buy nine A's with $900. I have $900 from short selling B's. So in fact, this $500 is not clear I even need it. Let's not go there yet. But what happens when I do that? I do my accounting and then I, same thing, uh, A goes up and B goes up less. And then these are my financials after a year. And I can see that I still make $33, $36, but on only $500, the return has gone up to 7.2%. This is the same trade, except I'm allocating less. If I'm buying A's only and I pay cash, I can't do this. But because I'm going short and shorting generates cash, I can do this. So my return is bigger and my beta is still low. So I've boosted my return with what's called leverage. In your assignment, uh, you had to do the leverage calculation for the snow it's no fund when I can have leverage. This is the same thing, except we do this with stocks. Okay. And now the next case, a bit of the extreme case, if you can think, well, if this is what, I, if this is the game we're playing, why don't I play this game with no money? Can I do this trade with no money? I short my B. $900 and then I buy my A's. I will make $36 profit, but since I invested no capital, my return is infinity. Can I do this? You cannot do this. Cannot. You need margin, which I'm going to explain. Okay, I will explain this next week. I'll explain this next week. For, for today, let me stick 
with this concept because this is very powerful. What we have seen here is very powerful. The ability of going short <clears throat> means that I can generate cash that I can use to invest more and boost my returns. So I can obtain leverage for free. For free. I don't have to borrow money in a certain sense. Okay? I'm borrowing a stock. I'm not borrowing money, but I'm borrowing a stock because that's what shorting means. I borrow, right? So there is some borrowing happening, but the borrow has to do with borrowing a stock, not borrowing money. <clears throat> and the result is that my return is boosted. And it's it's unclear how high, of course, this is too extreme. I cannot do this. But now the question is, how much money do I need for this? How much? How much money do I need for this? Zero I cannot do because I need margin. How much money do I need to do this? How high a return can I obtain? So this is the this is the this is a very important question. A very important question. It has an answer. The answer is here. <clears throat> okay, maybe I can do some of this now. The rest I'll, I'll start here next week. Because this is a very important concept, and I want you to be fully aware of this concept. Okay, <clears throat> um, this is a typical margin requirement. You need fifty percent collateral for long positions and eighty percent collateral for short positions. Why is that? That's because <clears throat> short positions, as we saw, have high risk profile. They have unlimited liability. That's why there's higher margin for shorts than for longs. Let's stick with these. Let's not question this. These are numbers which are questioned. Um, <clears throat> these are numbers which are banks have their own rules and it's very often like this. So when we do the margin calculations for A, I get $900 um, that I spent. I only need 450 for that. I only need 720 for the shorts, 80%. And because I get $900, that means that I need 270. That's it. I can do my trade with $270. Because my profit is always going to be $36. I can see that with $270, I have a profit of almost 17%. And it looks like low risk. This is good, very good. But I will answer this next week. There's a very big risk here. Can you see this? Can you see what the risk is? So this story I'll have to finish next week because this is very good. This is the best return. But it is a, it's a very high risk, very high risk. This portfolio will very likely blow up and I'll show you how that happens next week, okay? Um, I'm going to repeat some of these concepts from trade financing because they're very important. It is another way of doing leverage. Maybe I'll make some connections between this and your assignment number three, which you have already done by then, and there'll be some connections and then we can connect the snow swaps with how people trade stocks long and short. Okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll show you some historical examples too. So I think we've covered a lot of territory uh, today. Uh, I have one minute for questions. There's a comment on the chat. A manager has to maintain enough money to buy in more shares in case the stock goes down. This is a, almost, this is correct. This, you're right, uh, and I'm going to show you next week exactly how this works and exactly what happens when the stock goes down. And things that actually happened in the past, these things have happened, okay? And there's big risks that develop. And we will develop a way of thinking how we can create optimal portfolios like this. Okay, any questions? Okay, so in that case, I, um, I wish you a good night. I will send you assignment number five uh, next, which involves that you have to download data, so you have to get membership in that um, 
um, in that uh, website. I hope it works for you. And I'll, I will see you next week. <laughs>